Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. My name is Jay Fidel, and I'm with Think Tech Hawaii, and this is Community Matters, where we study the community because it matters, don't you think? And our guest right now is Ed Grieve. He's a photographer since 1822. Am I right, Ed? 1820, actually. <laughs> but he's more than that. He's a philosopher, and he's a traveler. So we're going to examine his work and his view of the world. Welcome to the show, Ed Grieve. Thank you. Ed's the father of a friend of mine, Hawala Grieve, who runs Pow Spam and and Pow Box and is doing tech things in Silicon Valley in San Francisco, a great guy. I know him 20 years, but this is the first day I've ever met Ed, his father. <laughs> he has good things to say about you. Yeah, I about him. So Ed, um, what have you been doing in photography? How'd you get into it? Um, when did you get into it? How has the, how has the process been for you? Well, all through um, college, um, my dad was a carpenter. He most, this is in California. I graduated from Long Beach State, and I always wanted a good stereo and a good camera. I, I couldn't tell you why, I just did from early age. But I did, couldn't afford um, either one, actually, until after I got out of school. And um, in my sophomore year at Long Beach State, there was a group of surfers getting ready to make a trip in, the, in December to Hawaii. I didn't surf, but it was, I, but I wasn't. I was athletic at the time, and I was interested. So I went with them, and you know, once I got here <laughs> and uh, caught a few waves, I was kind of hooked. On which one, uh, photography or surfing? surfing? No. Um, after about a year or so here, I worked in restaurants, saved money, and went. I got a boat. In those days, you this, could take. This was a, in the '60s. You could take a boat to Japan. They're, I don't think they have any more like that, but <laughs> it, was a, it was an inexpensive way to get there. And I figured, well, that's where I'll get my stereo and my camera. Of course, everybody did that then, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the yen rate at the time was 400 to 1. So it was definitely, and I didn't know one camera from another. So I went from shop to shop in the Ginza getting the, the, the clerks to show me everything they had. And I finally settled on Nikon F. Not because I knew anything about it, it just seemed to be a better camera for the money. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a surf photographer at the time, so I bought a long lens, came back. And it, but I, I needed a job, and since I had a degree and had surfed a lot, I, I went back home to, to LA, and I couldn't find, I was in January. And big companies used to recruit in those days from colleges, but they would come around in, in May. But in January, there were no recruiters. I couldn't find a job. And so, and I majored in political science. I mean, that's a, that's a hard major to find work <clears throat> in. So my sister lived and worked in New York with her husband. And uh, she said, oh, I'll come on back here. The company I work for hires every year about 12 to 15 management trainees. She said, they'll hire you. And by the way, they'll, they'll offset your law school. I was going to go to night. I went to night law school for a while. So I went back there, drove across country. Surfing USA was number one. <clears throat> those every, were the days. Ed. Every radio station. Boy, those were the days. Those were so, so fine to grow up and uh, be in college or trying to, you know, get integrated in the world in those days. The 50s are hard to replace. Yeah. Um, so how did you? But how did you? How did you so, get from there to here? And once here, how did you get to be a professional? Well, I had I had a this stint in Hawaii when I was in college. I I went back because I, I knew if I stayed in Hawaii, I wouldn't finish school. Mm -hmm. And uh, finishing school for my father, for my family, was a big deal. So after I went got the degree, spent another year here surfing mostly. Went, went to New York, and I went to work for Mutual of New York. It's a life insurance company. And I had bought the, by that time, I had the Nikon, and, I, and my brother-in-law, who was married to my sister, he was an art director at a major agency and a photographer. I learned, a, he was older than me, and he was a mentor to me, for sure, like an older brother. So he was looking for a, a side business that he could do 
to protect himself from being laid off as an art director, because that would happen to good ones and bad ones. Well, they come, they go, right? It's not a real, no longevity in that job. So I had, brought, I didn't bring my surfboard because I didn't think there was any surf in, on the East Coast, but I brought surf magazines, and he, he's, I was showing them to him. He was born and raised in Redondo Beach, but he, he wasn't a surfer. So he just, he said, um, Gee, there's no East Coast magazine. No, they're all on the West Coast. So we started what became Competition Surf. We specialized in smart surf, idea. surf meets. For We did five issues before we and you helped out of money. Him. Yeah, I was the editor and staff photographer in the beginning because we, did, <laughs> we didn't know anybody and you else. Were, you were here when? No, you, no, it was in New York. New York. You were doing yeah. the photography in New York. Yeah. Population-wise, in the surfing world, the East Coast has it like a tent over the California. It doesn't have as good a surf, but it's got miles and miles of sandy beaches that, that California doesn't actually have. I mean, the beaches are kind of rare. Yeah. So demographically, from the standpoint, and, and surfing in the, in the country was just on fire. Like, Surfing USA was number one across sure. the country. Those were the days of Gidget, of course. You remember. Yeah, I hated Gidget. <laughs> they, they popularized the sport, <laughs> and then everything got crowded. So most surfers didn't, don't like the Gidget movies. No, no, but it popularized it indeed. And then there was music, the, the Beach Boys, was it? The Beach Boys went to my high school. That right. They were, they were, they were, like freshmen and sophomores, and I didn't even know who they were. I didn't know about them. Those were the later. days up and coming. Well, actually, what it sounds like is, you know, you were, it was a perfect storm. You were in exactly the right place, knowing exactly the right people, and having exactly the right background and interest to get into photography, especially surfing photography, as, as an occupation. Well, when we started the magazine, um, my brother-in-law was the art director, and my sister did interviews on the beach. And my then, my first wife um, was the fashion editor. So she would gather up clothes and people would give us stuff and we would do a spread on, on the clothes. I was the editor and photographer and, and, and space salesman. I sold the ads. Anyway, um, so I started taking more and more pictures, built a dark room in the apartments that we lived in. I used to make um, carts, put my enlarger, which was very large, on a cart and rent a place that had a bathroom that had a nice, evenly boxed window that I could make a cover for, could knock the light out, wheel in my stuff, put the print washer in the bathtub, and I, had it, and I closed the door, put a towel along the bottom to keep light out. I had a number of dark rooms here and there like that. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> Who knew about digital then? <laughs> no, nobody. Uh, Not even a thought. <laughs> so my brother-in-law, while I was still working for the insurance company, I was doing sales promotion, so I was using a camera for that too. He called me up one night and he says, I need a picture of a, of a big computer early in the morning. Do you have access to your company's computer? And I, I did, because at the time I was not in sales, I was in, uh, I was in I, uh, the programming section. 32 women, all programmers, but they had a, a cycle that they ran on their computer, an IBM 7070. I don't know if you ever heard of those. Giant uh, tape drives and the raised floor, the whole works. But because I, I worked in, in that de in kind of a related department, at night they locked up, but they let me in. So I had a camera, and I lived within two blocks from the office. Went over, took some pictures. I got paid about 200 bucks, which was pretty good for the time. Yeah. And all I had to do, oh, I just took the, shot the film, took it to, uh, to a, a, a commercial lab, and I never saw it again. They developed it, sent everything over, and he picked out a, for, it was for an ad. Edited it, cropped it, all that. Did it, and I thought, that, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's yeah. pretty good pay. Then we started the magazine. We never made any money. And we had a, there was a bad, a bad summer one year, and a lot of our advertisers didn't pay for their ads because the kids didn't come in to, to buy boards, mm. unless the, if the weather wasn't good. <laughs> but I, that's when I developed my, and I started doing some street photography at the time, but I always wanted to come back to Hawaii. 
So my first wife and I, we came back in 67, and um, I would build these roll-away dark rooms. And, Were you earning a living in Hawaii from yeah, doing photography? Yeah, not, not from photography. So when did it get to be where photography was your number one interest? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I used to count the, the quality of a day and how many hours I was in the surf. If, it, <laughs> if I was in the water, eight hours is a good day. <laughs> anyway, um, I worked briefly for Pan Am for about a year, checking in people. And um, my wife was an RN, but she wanted, didn't want a nurse. So she, got, she went to Liberty House, ended up their top buyer a few years later. And um, I got a job at uh, Camera Hawaii. Uh, no, was, what was his name? It was a famous, at the time, <coughs> family-oriented photography business that catered to business. They didn't do um, things that I like to do. Um, but I didn't last long there. I, didn't, I wasn't really skilled at handling a 4 by 5 camera. Well, you did start to develop interest in special kinds of photography. What, what special kinds? Was that surfing? No, um, political, social stuff. While we had the magazine in New York, I met this, we met this guy from, who was a teacher in Florida, and he was hooked on surfing. But he also had a lens that was pretty good, and he could, take, he could write a complete sentence. A lot of our contributors couldn't. So we, had a, we were always looking for somebody that could you know, send stories and pictures, because I only had so much time. And um, he then, he moved to San Diego and became a, a, an editor of Surfing Magazine, which is the second biggest magazine. So he sent me a letter in about 1971 saying, surfers were becoming more concerned about the environment because they were losing surf sites to uh, boat harbors and things, pollution. And he said, we've heard of something called Save Our Surf. You know, could you look into that? I said, sure. So the next day, I'm in a, an old camera store that's gone now, Lawrence Hata's in Waikiki, and there's a poster, a handmade poster for Save Our Surf with a phone number. So I thought, well, this is my chance. So I called up, and it was John Kelly. And I told him why I was calling, and he said, oh, you know, they were meeting here two nights from now, and I'm, come, come on down. This was at his house in Black Point. So that's how I got started. I, can't, I come into this atmosphere of about 15 or 20 teenagers, running around planning for a big demo at the Capitol. And at that time, there hadn't been a big demo at, at the newer, cap, the new Capitol. It, would, it was the first major mass demonstration. In, or, on what issue? Uh, w the main issue was widening the beach at uh, Cujillo Beach. Mm -hmm. The state wanted to widen it for the tourists. And John showed through some research of his own that if you go, if you measure the usage of the beach dawn to dusk, not just the middle of the day, but dawn to dusk, there are about as many people, surfers, fishermen, uh, swimmers, whatever, be there early in the morning, whether the tourists or not. Anyway, he showed that it was just as important for others, other people other than so tourists. This was an intersection between your work, um, your surfing, your passion for surfing, and your work on the camera, and your training in political science. Absolutely. All three came together. Absolutely. We're going to take a short break. This sure. is Ed Grevy, a photographer, philosopher you begin to see, and traveler. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to see some of his work, and you will see the juncture of all of those things together in his work. We'll be right back.
foundation for a better life. That again. Okay, yeah, we're <laughs> talking with Ed Grevy, a photographer, philosopher, and traveler. He's told us about, um, you know, the, the, the strange in his life that brought him to Hawaii in the late 60s and early 70s that um, gave him an opportunity to surf, an opportunity to take pictures, an opportunity to get involved in, in, in uh, demonstrations with John Kelly, his mentor at the time, who was also a photographer. And um, from that point forward, he's taken a lot of pictures, and I think we ought to punctuate the show at this point, Ed, by taking a look at some of those pictures and trying to understand you better. Let's look at the first one. Can you tell us what this picture is? Uh, that's a uh, houseless person named Barbara Evelino at um, Makua Beach in 1996. This was shortly before the state evicted and arrested uh, the people that were living there, and... Um, she was homeless. She was homeless. Well, houseless, homeless. Yeah. Well, this um, was in 1996. Lived, That's 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, well, Makuo had been a long time place where people went uh, to the far end get their Wai life Nine. together. Yeah. They were kind of out of the limelight. And most of them were very shy about being photographed inside their makeshift homes, yeah. but she was not. Well, this is the challenge of the photographer, to get into position to have people accept his photography, um, to let people, to have people let him take their picture. Not everybody does. No, it's, it's, I developed a rule as I started, as when I started going out, mostly for John, he published a lot of leaflets and he would need pictures. So he would tell, he would make an arrangement and he'd say, go meet so-and-so at such and such. There's going to be a, an eviction struggle, and that's why I started in Waiholi Waikana. I went out and toured the neighborhood with um, um, a, one of the residents there. But I developed the understanding as far as doing that kind of documentary work. I worked with people that, I, that uh, invited me or knew me or whatever, because otherwise, you know, I'm just a stranger with cameras. Well, they will let you do it. Okay, let's look at, let's look at that picture more carefully now. I'm going to hold it up and <clears throat> see if we can get a, a good shot of it. There's much more to the picture than you saw a minute ago with Barbara, what was her name? Avellino. Avellino. So you see now the, the extensions on the left and the right from the smaller cropped picture to the larger one. So you can see uh, a container, which is a home uh, over on this, this side. And, um, and somebody is in there. This is really, uh, this is an amazing piece of art because it tells you so many stories. Can you tell us some of the stories that... Okay, well, the people at Mac who lived in Makua at the time were mostly temporarily there while they get their life together, so to speak. And um, it w there was no rent, so... There and then in the background here, the, the other part of this picture, this is, these are Japanese visitors or tourists who would come out to Makua uh, on these kind of um, small bus excursions. So at the same time, you see this homeless setup, which she was very proud. Most of the people that I photographed were hesitant to be photographed inside their homes, mm, yeah. but she was not. She was very proud as, yeah. as she looks in this picture. Well, I, I really, the comp composition of this photograph is extraordinary, the stories it tells. The technical perfection of it, you could count every leaf on those trees. Well, it's, if, if for the techies out there, it's shot with a two and a quarter by four and a half uh, panorama camera. Yeah, you so caught it all. It's, it's medium so it's, format. So it's so interesting to see that the smaller version, the four by three version that we saw a minute ago on the screen, is only a small part of the larger panoramic photograph. And you cannot possibly appreciate all the information in this photograph until you see the panoramic one. Let's go to the next. Uh, let's go to the next photograph and and try to uh, see what's happening with the evolution of. Okay, of this work. was one of my earliest ventures into um, political, social, political work. John Kelly sent me to Kauai for a week in 19 around 1970 or 71. And I had started taking pictures locally, surf-related pictures, but there came a time when SOS 
told the kids, uh, we've won most of the battles, we're going to get a sewage plant. Uh, you can go back to your life before this if you if you choose, but there is a big there is a big eviction struggles are propping up everywhere, and the the other side of that is the same people you've researched for the surfing problems of beach widenings and things, the bankers, the developers, all of those people you'll find the same ones are are behind a lot of these evictions. Somehow, somebody in Kauai, um, probably Stanford Achi, got a hold of John to make a, um, a presentation at a land use commission hearing. The developer for this particular piece of land needed rezoning from the state and Kauai County in order to build this big development. But he had to evict people on a small uh, Hawaiian estate called the Kanoa well, estate. It was in transition in those days. We were. We were moving to a state, a state mentality. The plantations were closing down. People couldn't be sure of their occupation or their income. And they were in between and in betwixt economically. And thus you had people who were essentially didn't have a home or a job. This community in Niamala and Willy Willy lasted. They, they got so good at fending off developers um, that they, when the new one would pop up and buy the rights from the prior outfit that failed, there were big scandals. There was huge um, bribery, bribery scandal, well, protest too. Yeah. It was one of the only places in Hawaii at that time where people actually got arrested and there were... So there were you were documenting history at the time. You were documenting the protest. I mean, I surmise that you're a bit of a protester yourself, Ed. Am I right about that? Well, um, I, I agree with it's my way to contribute to people that have a cause that I agree with. Well, you were advancing the cause essentially by, well, by documenting you know, it. I, I'm not good as an organizer. I have a camera and I have some experience and I and I have learned how to do certain these are, things. But do these pictures that you're taking, um, you know, in the 90s, the one we saw uh, and the one just now back on Kauai, um, did they get published in the newspaper? They looked certainly worthy of newspaper publication. Well, the two news at the time, there were two daily papers. They did not, and unless there was a special circumstance, the photographers in those days, and I think they still have a union that's very strong. They don't allow the paper to buy pictures from non-union photographers. Non-union, oh. unless unless yeah. there's an event they want to cover, yeah, and they they, they don't have staff to get they there. Don't have a choice. Because yeah. uh, on Mokawea Island that happened, and they paid, they paid me to go take pictures for a full-page article on, yeah. on those evictions. But for the most part, no. Um, I've been in many magazines with, to supplement articles about the Hawaiian movement yeah. uh, and, other th and some other things. But for the most part, um, I have two books out. This is the one that... Well, we have one right here. Let's look yeah. at that for a minute. Uh, let's take a shot at that. This is... Uh a book that uh, uh, Ed put together. It's called Kue, and it's got a bunch of his photographs. Now, where can I, where can I get this book, Ed? I think the only place, that's 12 years old. <laughs> where can I get um, it? Can I go to Amazon and buy it? Can I go yeah, to a bookstore and buy yeah, it? No, I don't think they carry them on bookstores anymore. Oh, is that right? I have a supply that I sell at okay. a discount. But. Well, you, can, you can contact Ed, by the way, at ed at edgreevy.com. And also at Ulukau. Huh? Ulukau.org. Ulukau just has a website. And we, you can see his portfolio there. <clears throat> and let me add that when Ed <coughs> came to the studio today with our mutual friend, Malcolm Makaru, who is here behind the lights and who has been a friend of ThinkTech from the beginning, really, um, they brought a portfolio box of Ed's photographs that weighs about 50 pounds. And if we, had a, if we had eight hours to do a show in, I'm sure we could cover them all. Um, but point is, there's a lot of photographs. And if you want to see Ed's photographs, not only for the art of Ed's photographs, but for the historical value, you know, the documentary value, they are powerful. Uh, because Ed, he is... is edgreevy.com. Edgreevy.com, okay? There's so, 3,000 pictures there. 3,000 pictures. I have about... In black and white negatives, I have about 60,000. Yeah, okay. And, you know, it's, it's important 
document Hawaii that way, to see Hawaii from Ed's eyes. So you said this is Kuei book is one. There was another book too? What's that? It's a more recent book. Duke, Duke University has something for indigenous people. So they have a whole department there. This is Duke back in North yeah, Carolina. Yeah, of course. And um, it's kind of complicated to explain. Um, where, where, can I, where can I see that book? That is available at um, Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble, okay. It's called um, A Nation Rising, Hawaiian, the, 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 the Struggle for Hawaiian Land and Sea and Sovereignty, I think. Important. It's a long title. How long ago was That's it? a textbook. This is, this is a photo essay. So you wrote the copy for that no, book? No, there were like 28 different oh, authors. Oh, essays. Ikaika Hussey, I don't know if you know him. Sure, he's been on the show a number of times. He's the one that put the uh, thing he, together. He produces, uh, he publishes uh, Summit Magazine, Summit Magazine. I was approached several years ago by uh, an editor at um, UH Press who had, seen, who had seen my pictures because she edited books where people bought my pictures, and so she had seen some of my work. So she called me in and um, said they wanted to do a book similar to, to what finally got published. And I, I went, wow, that's great. I would never have you know, thought to call you. <laughs> and, um, but then I needed, a, I needed somebody to write the book. And Haunani and I had planned to do it's that, Haunani Trask, Trask in, the, in the early 80s. But uh, she got busy, and I, I approached her. I said, well, we got a publisher. We only have a, a minute left, Ed, and I, and I want to I wanna show the picture of Hanani Trask. Can, okay. can, can we find that one? It's a woman sitting, sitting. at a table, um, and it's Hanani Trask when she was, what, 15 or so? And uh, we, we, we all know her differently now, but this is the picture of the essential Hanani Trask. Later became famous at the university for activism and protest. Uh, was What's famous. the circumstances of this photograph? Um, we wanted, we, I had met her through from political people before, but um, I had decided to enter a photo show, but I needed captions. And I was pretty sure she could write well. So I already knew her, and I approached her. I said, I, I'm going to be in this show at Alamoana Center and um, I need somebody to write captions because my pictures are not that meaningful unless you know what's going on. This is she said 19... yes. Yeah, well, she's very enthusiastic. This was, this was in the 80s. Oh, in the 80s, that yeah. late. Yeah. Uh, the first hurricane, we had two, right? We had a Niki, but there was one bef 10 years before yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. What was that called? Eva. Uh, I, I know what you mean, but I can't remember. It was right around that it. time, so it was yeah. early 80s. Yeah. And so we went, and then we, we were planning a show, an exhibit, and we were that was taken at the coffee. Eva. Eva. Eva and Aniki. Yeah. It was taken, this picture was taken at a small gallery at the YWCA across from the UH. You know, mm -hmm. you know yeah, 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 yeah. forget the name of that. Anyway, so we were just scouting for a place that would allow us to show pictures, and um, I just I had this whole... Was. Well, that's really significant. Uh, it's, it's really a very interesting portrait of her, especially in light of all that has happened since that time. You know, sometimes you take a photograph of somebody and, you know, you're not only looking at the person and into the person's soul, maybe in a funny way you're looking into the person's future. And I think that's, uh, that's a really special photograph. There are so many more. There are so many more we have um, on, on electronic slides, and there's so many more in this huge 50-pound box you brought. Uh, thank you, Malcolm Macaro. Uh, and we don't have time for more, but I, I can only urge people to uh, check Ed Grevy out. His work spans, what, four decades, well, five decades? Early seven, from 71. Yeah, yeah, that's a long time And already. I still shoot digital for, the, for the techies out there. And that's a whole new show to talk about your digital experience. EdGreevy.com and also Ulukau, Ulukau. Dot dot org. Org. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ed. It's great to see you, You're to meet you, to spend the time with you. Aloha.